All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're going to be doing uh, Field and uh, Perimetry Pearls uh, by Dr. Joe Salka. Uh, Dr. Joseph Salka is an attending optometric physician at Center for Sight uh, in Sarasota, Florida, a large medical surgical practice where he focuses on glaucoma management and neuroophthalmic disease. He is formerly a professor of optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years, where he served as chief of the advanced care service and a director of glaucoma services at the college's eye institute. He was the program coordinator and supervisor for the ocular disease residency. Dr. Salka is a founding member of both the Optometric Glaucoma Society and the Optometric Retina Society. He is also a founder and chair of the Neuroophthalmic Disorders in Optometry Special Interest Group for the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Salka is a glaucoma diplomate of the American Academy of Optometry and in 2021 and 2022, he was ranked number four optometrist by the U.S. by U.S. by Newsweek magazine, uh, America's best eye doctors mm -hmm. list. He is a partner and co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. He's a good friend. He's a colleague. He's an educator. Please welcome Dr. Joe Salka. All right. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm we're happy to be here, especially after the hurricane. Happy to be anywhere. And we're going to talk uh, a little bit of a deep dive on on perimetry. Uh, a few weeks ago, Greg did a tremendous uh, led a tremendous lecture on uh, bringing love back to the visual fields, and people were kind of requesting uh, more information about interpretation, and uh, that's why I'm coming back so soon with a with a visual field lecture. We're going to talk a bit about uh, perimetry and interpretation, what these things mean. I've got no uh, financial interest in uh, anything we may be discussing here. Uh, all my relative uh, relationships have been mitigated. As Greg says, I'm a co-owner of OEC, and this is something I put together uh, myself. Now, this lecture is going to focus on Humphrey visual field because this is the most common form of perimetry and the one that I use. I've got most, uh, most uh, experience with it. Now, the discussions tonight are going to apply across many branded devices, but nothing uh, should be construed that this technology is superior to any other form of perimetry. Any inclusion or exclusion of any parametric technology doesn't imply superiority or inferiority. It is just our personal experiences. <laughs> And I think that brings us to polling question number one. And Joe, I did modify your polling question slightly. So you okay. I added Hero and some wearables and, and so on and so forth. And I, I added that if someone wants to put what they do and the, something else in the chat box, but if you want to read it, read it's it. there. So a Humphrey analyzer, a FDT perimeter, a matrix perimeter, an Essilor perimeter, an Oculus uh, of some sort, or a wearable such as a Hero or other type of wearable that's out there. Or I use something else. There's an octopus and, that rolled into the uh, into mm -hmm. the uh, into the chat. Good perimeter. Someone asked about this, this certificate that will be sent via email That's usually within, about, within, a, within about a day or two. And it uh, looks like we're pretty good, Joe. I'm going to end the poll, mm -hmm. share the results, and there you go. A lot of people have experience with the, uh, the HFA or the FTT perimeter. Uh, some have the matrix perimeter, some other other things. Some of the wearables are coming up there. These are all good technologies, and they all fit well into our uh, our clinical acumen. So, looking at this, you know, parametrically, we have uh, what is the the island of vision. This fixation point is is a foveola, and that's the the peak of the of our island of vision. And as we go more eccentrically, you know, the the sensitivity is going to diminish. And of course, we have this hole, which represents a physiologic blind spot or the optic disc papillae. 
Now, the normal visual field parameters, it's about 60 degrees superiorly, 60 degrees nasally, about 75 degrees inferiorly, and 100 degrees temporally. Now, the macula is the central 13 degrees, and the fovea, and the fovea is the central three degrees. And this is all limited by the size of the retina and uh, the margins of the orbit. Now, that might be a little bit uh, less in some patients, might be a little bit more in other individuals, but this is a pretty good roundabout as to what we're, you know, what our, our normal parameters are. Now, trying to determine what is a threshold, we, we're looking for what is called the frequency of seeing curve, where the patient will see a lighted stimulus 50% of the time, and 50% of the time, they won't see it. Thus, that is threshold. And the way these devices have historically done it, they start with a, uh, a very, very bright light that's easy for a patient to see. Then they have a light that is too dim to be seen. Then they're going to go and do a light that's not quite as bright and another light that's not quite as dim. And they're going to get to that frequency of seeing curve for all those points that are going to be tested across the retina. So the frequency of seeing, seeing curve is what threshold does a patient see it, a stimulus 50% of the time and 50% of the time they won't see it. And Greg, that actually brings me to calling question number two already. My main field test is a 24-2, a 30-2, a 10-2, a 120 point full field screening, or I'll put something else in the box. And I'm just going to share, you know, a lot of people don't understand what, you know, maybe what, what does the two mean? Uh, and what the two means, and that's just a name, right? 24 means 24 degrees, 30 is 30 degrees, 10 is 10 degrees. But the dash two means when it looks at the vertical and horizontal uh, meridians, there are points on each side of it. Whereas we used to have 24-1, 30-1, and 10-1. Those points were actually on the horizontal and vertical meridian. They had tested points on there, and it was determined, you know, due to because of neurologic disease, that didn't really make sense. So the dash ones disappeared in favor of the dash two, where points will straddle the horizontal and vertical meridian. Did you know that, Greg? I did know that uh, was on it and, and straddling it, yes. Okay, I think we got a pretty good response in here. And it looks like the main field test is a 24-2. Uh, I think that most people, that's probably most common, 30-2. Uh, is also a very common and popular test. And the other ones are a little bit more uh, detailed or functional. And good, excellent. I see Greg has launched the handouts. All right. You know, 24, 30, 10, 30 to, the 30-2 is going to test 76 locations. 24 is going to be 54 locations, but they they both test 30 degrees nasal. So you're, lo you're losing a little bit temporally in the 24-2. Diagnostically, there's not a lot that's being lost. It's been shown that by dropping those 10 those temporal points, you might be disadvantage in picking up some early progression on a visual field. But in terms of glaucoma, 30 and 24 attach the same 30 degrees nasal. 24-2 has really become the visual field for glaucoma. You know, only a very small percentage are going to be in the peripheral visual field alone. You know, the 30-2, there are a few more points that can probably find progression earlier. And the 10 2 is 10 degrees temporally and nasally and is testing overall 68 points. It's very good for macular disease, retinal disease, neuroophthalmic disease, and patients with, uh, with advanced glaucoma. And this is just what is being shown or, or stimulating the retina here as we go across. These are the, where the 54 points are going to be 
uh, on uh, on on twenty four dash two. This is the pattern that is being shown. Now, one thing I'm going to throw out is just sort of a historical uh, reference. Uh, former President uh, George H. W. Bush actually. Uh, used to use a term, a thousand points of light in some of his speeches. And he used that sort of motivational. He used it uh, metaphorically. And the reason he came to it is he took visual fields. Uh, former President Bush had exfoliation syndrome and probably exfoliative glaucoma. And this is Harry Quigley from Johns Hopkins. He's a noted glaucoma specialist, and he was a president's doctor who was treating his exfoliation syndrome, ex exfoliation glaucoma. So whenever, he, whenever Dr., uh, President Bush referenced a thousand points of light, that's what he's talking about. He's actually talking no about sound. visual fields. I'm watching this webinar. I don't know. I got him. I got him. <laughs> Steve doesn't have sound, but we got his sound. Now, standard automated perimetry. Now, that's really what we call white on white. Is how... How dim of a light can a pa can a patient perceive at various yeah, it's, points? It's about it's something, and I'm the only one complaining. Okay, so this is the this is the white on white perimetry, and it's trying to determine what what's the dimmest that a patient can see at all these points tested. CETA, Swedish interacting thresholding algorithm, is more a more advanced type of parametric uh, strategy. Uh, it's, a, it's an algorithm that uses uh, artificial intelligence. It really estimates the expected threshold based upon a patient's age and naming thresholds. And it is done to reduce time necessary to, uh, to test visual field. I will say that to accurately determine the threshold of every point, is laborious. It would take a very long time. And as the patient goes through these tests, they get bored and they become inattentive and their reliability goes down. So this was an algorithm that was developed to decrease fatigue, increase reliability, and it's really applicable in many of the computerized automated perimeters. It can be applied to standard automated perimetry, also short wavelength automated perimetry, which was the historical blue-yellow, which people don't seem to really use at this time any longer. Now, for a long time, we had seen a standard and we had seen a fast. And what was the difference? Well, one was faster. Question is, how does it be, how, how is it actually faster? Well, there is something in, CETA called the ERM, the error related factor, meaning it the computer will accept a degree of uncertainty as to where the threshold is. Now, CETA standard is a longer test. It will cross thresholds several to, uh, more often than CETA fast. Have to go in the other room. It will it will do it. Uh, hold on a second. I got to put this back. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so it'll it'll cross. See if standard crosses more more than see the fast. See the fast is a a good screening tool, but the the difference between the two is the error related fact factor. See the fast will accept a greater degree of uncertainty as to what threshold is. So in CETA fast, it's a good screening tool, it's good for neuroophthalmic disease, but it is a test pattern that is likely to miss early disease. It's accepting a greater degree of uncertainty. But it was necessary because they needed a screening tool uh, within the Humphrey perimeter. Now we have something called CETA faster. And see the faster is just that. It's about a two, two and a half minute test for normal patients. It's about 50% faster than see the standard and about 30% faster than see the fast. And it is really qu clinically equivalent to the fast and the standard algorithms. Now, a, pa a paper just came out. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I sent it to you, Greg, 
but a paper came out that actually looked at CETA standard and CETA faster in in per parametric naive patients, people who, are, who have never taken, who are normal people who had never taken visual fields before. And what they found was, yes, CETA faster was about 60% uh, faster than CETA standard. And it really was very, very similar in terms of the results. The only negative that came out of it was in naive patients, the false positives were high in both tests. But on repeat tests, that went down. Now, this is going to remove unnecessary dead time. It's not going to, to monitor the blind spot. And it removes false negatives. And it really relies on gaze monitoring and false positives to look at the quality of the, of the test. Now we can actually mix and match uh, these guided progression analysis and even your visual analysis. We were always taught that we should not mix the reports, meaning if a patient's on a CETA stand, we can't compare it to a CETA fast or a CETA faster. Well, studies now show that they're really pretty clinically equivalent. And they do allow intermixing. So if a patient is, is being followed on a CETA standard and a CETA faster is put into the, uh, into the progression analysis, it doesn't really affect the results. They're all now really pretty well clinically uh, equivalent. And Greg, that brings me to polling question number three. My preferred testing is a full threshold, a CETA standard, a CETA fast, a CETA faster, a CETA blue yellow perimetry, or I'll put something else in the chat box. And I know, Greg, that uh, it's not, I mean, it's actually not well known. This was something that was under development while I, while I was in uh, while I was in academia and running the glaucoma service and working with third year students. Uh, we came up with something I think called CETA slow. I have no idea how they take an hour doing a visual field. <laughs> well, it was accurate. Mm -hmm. All right, so. I think we got a good response rate. And CETA fast is, is the most popular one. Uh, fewer people are using CETA faster and it's possible because they have older units that doesn't have that, uh, that program. CETA standard is up there. And some people still might be using uh, full threshold uh, perimetry. You know, do you put the phobia on or do you put the phobia off? Well, you know, the instrument, instrument can go to 51 decibels. And uh, a young person with clear media and no pathology maybe can get macular to about 40 decibels. And that's even very, uh, very rare. But your acuity and your threshold really should correlate. They should validate each other. You know, if you got good visual, uh, good visual acuity, but the threshold is low. There might be some early damage to the fovea from a drug toxicity or something similar. And about half of patients who have 20-20 vision are going to have threshold better or at or better than 37 decibels. So this is could help identify visual acuity with possible non-organic uh, vision loss. In terms of interpreting visual fields, we don't really look at them as reliable or unreliable any longer. It's not a yes or no. I can't use it or I can use it. We really have to look at it as a continuum from highly reliable to marginally informative to no useful information. And there is no criteria that defines what this is. That we all have to look at the tests, we have to look at the gaze trap. We have to listen to the perimetrist. We have to look at the anatomy, compare it to past visual fields, and determine is there highly useful information here? Is there minimally useful information here? Or is there no useful information here? 
The false positives when patients were responding inappropriately does strongly impact in the information that you're getting, but it doesn't mean it can't be used. Greg, I think you and I probably disagree on this point a little bit. I know you are not... Uh, you're, you're, you're very sensitive to the high false positives. Do you want to discuss that for a sec? Well, yeah, when it comes to a glaucoma, this visual field, um, a false positive um, can really throw off the algorithm because the patient is being trigger happy. And if it raises it a little bit more abnormally, then it just pushes it down. So between a false, not, false positive and a false negative, False positives can destroy the visual field, but false negatives are expected on a glaucomatous visual field, right? Because you're thresholding a, a ganglion cell. And, you know, if it's wounded from glaucoma, then it's going to take a little bit longer to recover. So if you threshold it and it finds it and you hit it with the bright light, but then you go back and you check it. Well, it might not have recovered to be able to really, you know, and in, in able to see that second stimulus. So in a sense, false positives being a little bit high in the visual field could be an indicator that it is a glaucoma, this visual field, but false positives can really throw off that algorithm. And for people, you know, to understand there, there's no defined criteria. I mean, that is all kind of personal. Many clinicians will say once you go over 10%, they don't like to look at the visual field. Most glaucoma studies uh, allow up to about 20%. I think where we, we differ, Greg, is it, it is not as impactful to me as it is to you. I, I've looked at patients who have had a fairly high false positive, and I, and I recognize that the information did represent the true re retrolenticular visual field loss, or I can tell it may be high false positive, but the visual field actually really kind of is normal. What I don't like is the abnormally high sensitivity on the glaucoma hemifield test. That to me, it makes it absolutely worthless. I, I won't even look at, uh, at the visual field. Yeah, the gaze tracker using the Purkinje images in the cornea is a probably a better indicator than the blind spot monitor. So we, we don't have the absolutes anymore. We don't have reliable or unreliable. We have a continuum. And progression is not merely, it's merely present or absent. It's not just a yes or no. Is What is the rate of change? You can have progression with a slow rate of change that may not impact the patient's life or you can have progression with a fast rate of change that will impact the patient's life. And these are just various devices that for the most part involve a patient, you know, sitting in, sitting in the device with uh, usually some trial, trial lenses or some other visual correction where they are responding in some way that they're seeing the lights. Now we have some nice wearable technologies that I think are, are going to change how uh, we look at these devices. And I think they're actually very, very, uh, very, very good. Now, obviously, the patient needs a near correction, and the perimeter is going to you know, tell you what to do. And I've always said, when in doubt, look at the last uh, field and use that trial lens. And it needs to be put as close to the eye as possible. You can see right here, this is a very poor setup, which will give you that uh, trial ring lens, what I call lensoma or scotoma. I used to actually have this visual field oath that I, I, I made my students in the glaucoma service uh, refer to and uh, recite to me. Or they'd have to tell me that they pledge that they'll ensure a presbyopic patient has a near correction, that they'll use the same trial lens used in the last test, keep the trial lens as close to the eye as possible, not waste time refracting or neutralizing glasses. If there's a trial lens in the chart, Patch an eye unless they're using an estimate visual field. Use a 24-2 st see the standard default. Stop the test if they know the patient's actually falling asleep and not repeat a test on their own volition just because there's high fixation losses. And feel free to save uh, share this with your, your technicians that, and your perimeters that do the test for you. Now, one thing Greg and I talked about last time, I think is worth uh, discussing again, is what is the patient actually seeing? And there's information that's out there in popular literature available to patients where they're describing this as tunnel vision, where 
They have normal vision, everything is fine. Early glaucoma, there's a little bit of haze at the edges. Advanced glaucoma, it's coming in a little bit. And extreme glaucoma or advanced gla or, or, or end stage, they just have that small fixation. And this is not real. This is not how it happens. And this is a disservice because if, if patients see this and they think, well, that's not me. I, I don't have that happen. I, I must be fine. That's not really happening. This is what's happening. Things are missing in the visual field. They don't see black. They just don't see it. it the brain kind of fills it in and grays it out. There's a car here, but it's not clear for the patient. Or we have this normal visual field, kids chasing a bar, ball across the road. Whereas if there is this inferior arc grid defect, you can actually not see the kid. It's not black. He just, they don't see them. They don't see the step. It's not they stepped into a black hole. They don't see the step when they trip. And here we lose the kids. We lose the cars. We lose the buildings as the, as the disease progresses. You know, this is a, a nice example of, you know, we can see there's an older woman who's crossing the street carrying uh, probably uh, some luggage with her. Now, if there is a significant superior arc or defect, they're not seeing black. They're just not seeing her. She's not there. The brain fills in the rest. There's a, there's a fuzz there. And I think the way we depict these for patients on our printouts, if we ever share printouts with patients, we're doing a bit of a disservice. And we're showing them the areas where they didn't see. And we explain to the patients, well, these black areas are areas that you didn't see. And I think we've all looked at patients who've looked back at us with this quizzical look, and they're probably thinking to themselves, oh, I don't, I don't see that. I don't, I don't, there's no black spot in my vision. It's probably better to depict it like this. And this is a grayscale from a high false positive patient. And there's missing areas, you get this white scotoma. And this is really what is actually happening. This is you should be seeing all of this. And these are the areas that you didn't see. It's not black, it just isn't there. And a nice way to think about it is think about the physiologic blind spot. I, I think when we, you know, when we were in optometry school, we all tested when we learned about it, we all tested ourselves. We would close an eye and we would try to figure out where, where our fingertip disappeared. Well, you close an eye, you don't have a black spot there. You just have a missing spot. When something gets in there, it disappears. So that's really what is happening in these patients. And, hey, you know, Joe, what, before, yeah. you, before you move on, two comments yeah. here is, mm -hmm. you know, I had a patient today that came in with a nice superior arcuate. Luckily, the other eye did not have a superior arcuate, and I showed the visual field, and, you know, it had some zeros in a couple spots. And so I kind of did the old red cap test. You know, I said, hey, look right here at my nose, cover your eye. And I said, you could see the red cap down here, right? Took the bottle of whatever, phenylephrine, picamide. Yeah, I could see that. Keep looking at my nose and moved it up. And they kind of just chuckled, laughed, like, <laughs> I can't see it. And moved it back down. Oh, I can see it. Moved it back up. They could see it. So, you know, sometimes it might be worth kind of showing the patient that because oh especially if it's that inferior, they can have increased trips and falls and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The other comment that I was going to make is you mentioned about with the uh, Humphrey visual field, it's set for near. Um, and remember that trial lens with the kind of wearables that are out there. And I'm familiar with Hero since I have it in the office is that it's a distance prescription for that one. So that one's distance, mm -hmm. black screen, uh, Humphrey is kind of near at that 30, you know, that 30 centimeter or 33 centimeter set. So now here's a patient that I had uh, with pretty advanced uh, glaucoma. He was, he, was, uh, he was quite old. He was in his 90s. But if you take a look at it, you know, he's got this super, nice dense superior arcoscotoma in one eye and a dense inferior arcoscotoma in the other eye. But what happens when he opens both eyes? You know, his visual field is almost uh, fairly well complete. And this is what I call glaucoma monovision. One eye for distance, one eye for near. Distance, near. This is glaucoma monovision. If this happened uh, to every patient, they would be a whole lot more, more functional. 
Now, here's where I want to spend the meat of the lecture, and I'll stay on this as long as necessary. And if people have questions, they should be put into the into the chat box. And I will uh, I will pause after I get through this section to, to talk about some things. But interpreting the single field analysis. Now, I have thrown something here, and this is an actually a very old test. This and I post this off the internet. It's, you know, most of it's in a different language. This is full threshold. Now, I'm going to come back and look at this again because there are some things here that have some pertinence to us that to understand. But I point out here a near 17 minute test for one eye. And we have a number of points that have uh, other values underneath it in parentheses. I'll talk about that and what that means. And a few more global indices that we may not be comfortable seeing, but they actually have some pertinence. I will tell you what they are and why they're not in there any longer. But let's start talking about the, the single field analysis. There's a lot of things here to look at. And I'm going to talk about how things used to be done and how things are being done now and why things may or may not be better. But when we look at a visual field like this, we have to look at a number of things. And the first thing we, we usually look at is the reliability, the reliability parameters. That's what we right have right here. We have fixation losses, we have false positive errors, and we have false negative errors. Now, fixation losses here is due to the, the blind spot monitoring. The machine knows about where the visual about where the blind spot should be if a patient is fixating properly. So what it'll do is it will test by sh by shining a lighted stimulus in the presumptive blind spot. A person who is is alert and well situated should not signal. So the machine determines that's where the blind spot is. Now, here's a caveat. Maybe the patient re, you know, repositions himself a little bit, or maybe it catches right at the edge of the patient's physiologic blind spot. Now, throughout the test, it may actually give a lighted stimulus where the patient's fixating well, but now it's shining on a sensitive part of the retina. And that comes off as a fixation loss. I've always said that if I threw out every visual field that was deemed by the computer to be unreliable based upon fixation losses, I would never have any visual fields at all to look at. I would rather hear from the perimetrist who tells me who's watching that patient's eye. Was the patient looking around or were they fixating properly? If the perimetrist tells me they were looking around, then those fixation losses are probably true because as they move around, move their fixation, the blind spot will change position and where the patient shouldn't see it, they do see a light of stimulus because they've changed fixation and there's a loss of fi fixation. False positive errors. The, this is a patient who is responding inappropriately to something other than the light. Now, the way that this used to be done is the machine actually had a projection system. It would move. You could actually feel it. You could hear it. And patients who are not hearing impaired would get these clues. And sometimes it would position its projection device to deliver a light of stimulus, but would not give it. And the patient feels the movement. They heard the, 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 the sound. They, they sense the duration, and then they signal, but there's no light. That was considered a false positive. Well, it doesn't work like that any longer. The way false positives are determined today, I think, is very elegant. The machine knows what is a normal range of response time for a given individual at a certain age. Now, if a patient were to respond to a light and stimulus, too fast or too slow beyond you know, outside that range of, of, of acceptable response time, it was listed as a false positive. 
because now the patient's responding to something other than the light. So it knows how long they should have. And if they don't respond in that period of time, they respond, but not in that period of time, it was listed as a false positive. They are responding to something other than the light of stimulus. False negative. Yeah, you know, we used to think that this was a sign of patients becoming becoming inattentive. Now, the way that this used to be done would be it the machine would determine the threshold at several points. It would determine what the threshold is. And then during the test, it would go back and give a light and stimulus nine decibels brighter than the threshold. Ergo, it should easily be seen. Now, if it wasn't seen, it was determined the patient was becoming inattentive because they should have seen it. Nowadays, they don't do that. All that takes time. Everything about the new program is to cut down time, increase reliability, and shorten the test. And this one here is still set, you know, over seven minutes long. So what happens is the machine will actually determine the threshold of all these points. Then it will retrospectively go back and identify what percentage of points the patient didn't see when they should have during the thresholding test or part of the program. And those are considered false negatives. So it just determined after it, after it figured out what the threshold values were, it determined what points or what stimuli during the test they didn't see that they should have. Doesn't take any more time. It's done retrospectively. And that was a false negative. The problem is it isn't really a sign of inattentiveness. It is really more a sign of true visual field loss. When we look at points here, if we look at these points, once a point has been damaged, or once, once an area of retinal sensitivity, those ganglion cells have been damaged, once it drops to 50% of its original value, subsequent stimuli will can be range anywhere from full perception of light to no perception of light, from full, full sensitivity to no sensitivity. They see nothing less than zero. These are our distressed areas of the retinal ganglion cells. There is highly, there's high degree of retinal sensitivity and variability in areas of true visual field loss. So the, the false negative is less a sign of inattentiveness. It is more a sign of there is true visual field loss with highly variable retinal sensitivities. And Bo Bankston did a really elegant, simple study where she looked at a number of patients who had true unilateral glaucoma, like a traumatic or inflammatory glaucoma, true unilateral disease. And they were and, and they did visual fields with a bad eye first, good eye, then good eye, bad, and then the bad eye. And they found that the, the patients who had true disease, true glaucoma, had high false negatives. And their fellow eye that was normal, there are low false negatives. And these are skilled uh, patients who are who are not parametrically naive. They had taken the test before, they had experience, but the diseased eye all had high false negatives. The non-diseased eye had virtually no false negatives. So the reliability parameters are interesting to look at but we have to consider what they actually tell us. Greg, is there anything you want to add to that? No, you covered it well. Well, the next thing that we're going to look at is the raw data. And these are expressed in decibels, meaning that the higher the number, the dimmer the light that the patient saw. Now, when we're in the foveal area, and here the fovea was turned off, but we're in the paraphobial area, we should be somewhere in the low 30s. And it's going to ta taper off into the 20s as we go more eccentrically. Points that are edge points are highly variable. Points that are around the blind spot tend to be a little bit variable as well. 
But these, these are the retinal sensitivities or the threshold values that the machine has determined uh, throughout this seven minute and 16 second test. Now we'll take a look at the grayscale. And the grayscale is, and as we discussed earlier, perhaps a misrepresentation of what's happening with these patients. Now, it's good for patient education. It is good for us to pick up neurological patterns, which we'll talk about later. But this is sort of a graphic representation of the values that we see here that have been that have been determined through the thresholding process. Now, this is all well and good, but it doesn't give me a heck of, of a lot of information yet. So we turn our attention to the total deviation and prob and its subsequent probability display. Now, as I look at these numbers, for example, this number right here, 23, I don't know exactly that, what that means in a patient who's 83 years old. So I look to this point, to the total deviation, and this is an age-matched correction or comparison to an 83-year-old person who has a normal visual field. And what that means is this value of 23 is actually six decibels lower than it should be in a normal person at that age. It is merely correcting for age. All right. Gives me some information. As we move over here, we have some points that are less than zero. And that is about 30, 27 to 30 decibels lower than should be for a person of that age. Good information, all right, it's getting that now, now I'm getting more information when I'm comparing it to an age-matched norm. Now, what does it mean in non-Gaussian optics? And we got the, 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 uh, the probability displays. Now that point 23, six decibels lower than it should be, is corresponding to this black square. And that black square is corresponding to a probability of less than 0.5%. Meaning, and this, one, this is not saying there's disease, there's not saying there's abnormality. What it's saying is this value of 23, which is six decibels lower than it should be, will be found in a normal person or a normal population less than a half a percent of time meaning that 99.5% of the time, that value will be seen in an abnormal situation. Yeah. Now, it's not saying it's abnormal. It's saying the probability of it being abnormal or the probability of it being normal is very low. Now, one point does not a diagnosis make, but as we, as we see patterns coalesce together with other adjacent points, we understand that it's the sum of the parts. So one point in an otherwise normal visual field that is even less than 0.5% doesn't really make a diagnosis. But when we put it together, we look at this, we still can't say that this is abnormal. What we can say is it is statistically highly unlikely to be normal. Greg, does that make sense? It does. Yep. All right. Well, that's pretty good. But I do know that ed the 83 year old people have other problems other than glaucoma. They have cataracts, or they have capsular haze, or they have bad vitreous, or they have media pacifications, or they have crummy corneas. There are a lot of things that, that can happen. I want to know what is the true retrolenticular visual field loss. And to do that, I'm going to look at the pattern deviation and its corresponding probability display. Now, I take a look at that 23. It's six decibels lower in an age match control. But I want to factor out all the things that happen equally across the visual field, meiosis, cataract, vitreal issues, 
And I want to see what is a true retro lenticular visual field loss. And the pattern deviation tells me it's a minus five. Now, how do we get rid of the cataract? How do we get rid of uh, a pacifications, meiosis? How do we how do we figure this out? Well, what the machine is going to do is it's going to rank these points, and you can't do it yourself. Okay, don't get a calculator out. Don't try to calculate. The machine weighs points that are closer to the edge and to the blind spot less heavily. They, they have their own algorithm, but it will line it from low to high. It's going to line all this information from low to high. It's going to identify the 85th percentile point in your patient, what they have, what they have, what they have given you in this test. It's going to identify what is the 85th percentile point and compare it to the 85th percentile point of a normal person at the same age. Now, in most situations, it's going to be lower. That 85th percentile point in your patient is going to be lower. So it's going to identify what degree of visual uh, of sensitivity can it add to your visual field, essentially bring it up, almost like curving the grade uh, on an exam, seeing what the average is and raising everybody's score up a little bit. So it identifies what is the 85th percentile point, compares it to an 85th percentile point of a normal person, which is usually going to be a little higher. And it's going to add some degree of sensitivity uniformly to this visual field to bring it up. And that's how it gets rid of all uniform depressions, such as cataract, such as meiosis, such as vitreal issues, vitreal clouding, anything that is affecting the visual field uniformly. It's finding that degree of, of sensitivity it can add and curve the grade up. Virtually always, the pattern deviation should be the same or better than the total deviation. And we look at the corresponding percentile point, and we find that when we take out any sort of uniform depression that's occurring, that point goes from a less than 0.5 to now a less than 1% meaning that you can still get this value in a normal person when we correct for age, meiosis, cataract, and everything else, but it's going to happen in less than 1% of normal people. Ergo, statistically, it is most likely to be abnormal. So that is how we get from the total deviation, how we filter out cataract and everything else to get us to the pattern deviation. This is the true retro lenticular visual field loss of this patient. Greg, have I lost anybody you think? Or are we good still? I don't see any questions in the chat box. So I'm thinking we're good. Right. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I'll monitor them for Joe. <laughs> now we've got the glaucoma hemifield test right over here. This is computer assisted interpretation. A lot of this is what is used in glaucoma studies and to, to interpret visual fields. Now, glaucoma hemifield test, there's two hemifields, a superior and an inferior hemifield. Glaucoma is a disease of asymmetry. The, the superior and inferior part of the nerve is asymmetric. The inferior and superior part of the visual field is asymmetric. The right and left eyes are asymmetric. It takes into account asymmetry. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump ahead. So what happens is the visual field will be broken up into five paired zones above and below the horizontal refay. It will look at the values in all of these uh, zones, and it will ascribe a score to each point uh, each zone and compare the zones above and below to one another. Now, let's say, let's look at 3A and 3B. The machine has done the thresholding. It has determined what is, what is what the values are here for 3A and 3B. And if the difference 
in 3A and 3B or any other match zone, if the difference is so great that it's going to be seen in less than 1% of normal people, it's going to say outside normal limits. Could be 4A and 4B, 1A, 1B, 5A, 5B, any score where the match zones differ by so much that you're only going to find that in less than 1% of normal people, then it's going to say outside normal limits. Or if, say, the zone 4A and 4B are roughly the same, the score is roughly the same, but it is so uniformly depressed that you're going to find those scores in less than a half a percent of the normal population, it will also say outside normal limits. So you can have an extreme difference between any match zone or a paired zone may be very sim similar. They may have similar, similar scores, but the scores are so low, you're only going to find that in less than a half percent of normal people, it will also say outside normal limits. That is very, very compelling. Now, if the score in any match zone, this has to be one, one or more match zones, if the difference in score is less than would be seen in 3% of normal people, but not 1%, it will say borderline. So if 1A and 1B are different, but they don't make the 1% criteria, they make the 3% criteria, meaning that you'll find that difference in less than 3% of normal people, it'll say borderline. Now, those are two, there's a two possible messages. A third message. If that 85th percentile score that I just talked about, getting from the total deviation to the pattern deviation, if that value is so low and it has to raise that up so high, raise it up so high, that that value is going to be seen in less than a half a percent of normal people, it will say general reduction of sensitivity. That is cataract. That is media. That is widespread diffuse loss. So if the if the if the elevator factor, the 85th percentile point in your patient is so low that it's going to be seen in less than a half percent of normal people, it'll say general reduction of sensitivity. That is cataract. Now let's go the other way. Let's say. The, the 85th percentile point is above normal. That does happen very rarely. Let's say it's above normal and actually it has to bring it down to match normal. Your patient is so super sensitive, it actually has to come down to meet normal. If that value is such that it's going to be seen in less than a half percent of normal people, it will say abnormally high sensitivity. That is an unreliable visual field. High, high values, high false positive, useless. Abnormally high sensitivity is abnormally useless. And if none of those criteria I just described are met, it's going to say within normal limits. And that's how the glaucoma hemifield test works. Greg, we still good? We still. Uh, anybody I believe so. Nothing's Nobody's... nothing's nothing's rolling in for questions, so we're good. Okay. Now, up until now, we have looked at everything on a point by point basis. Sometimes we want to look at the average, and we start looking at the global indices. That's it. It's global. It's looking. It's it's boiling everything down to one integer. Now, the mean deviation is the weighted average of the total deviation. And again, don't get out your calculator and try to calculate it. The machine weights some points heavier than others. But it's the basically the weighted average. This is the average hill of vision. And it's comparing to the average hill of vision of a normal person at the same age. Now, this is minus 6.91.
almost six, the, the average hill of vision of this patient, when we average all this together and compare it to age, it's about six decibels lower than it should be in a normal population. And that can be seen in somebody who is normal, but it's going to happen less than half a percent of time. Ergo, statistically, we, we assume that it's abnormal. It, it, it's not saying it's abnormal, but statistically, it's very unlikely to be, that value is very unlikely to be found in a normal population. A normal person will happen less than a half a percent of time. Now we have the PSD. This is a pattern standard deviation. Standard deviation. How do points value compare to one another? In a normal visual field or in a horribly abnormal visual field, adjacent points should be relatively similar. They should they should actually they should actually match uh, match very well. So a normal visual field, adjacent points are going to be very similar. In an abnormal visual field, adjacent points are not similar. The standard deviation between those points are, are really quite great. It's really quite great. The, pa the pattern standard deviation, as this number increases, it's never negative. It's always, it, it, it's, it's just the... Uh, it is not. It is not a negative. Not a neg negative integer. It, it is just represented as this is a standard deviation. A higher number here tells you there's focal defects in the visual field. So mean deviation could be cataract. All right. You forget all this. If you look at a mean deviation of minus five point nine one, no, knowing nothing else, it could be cataract. And the pattern deviation, standard deviation, would be very low because all points will be relatively the same. When the pattern standard deviation is high, it tells you there's focal defects and there's focal visual field loss. Now we also have the visual field index, the VFI. This was actually determined or developed to be used in progression analyses. And in the progression analyses, they want to try to look at what degree of visual field is left. And this is a representation, basically a weighted representation of the pattern deviation. Now, the mean deviation doesn't take into account cataract or any other diffuse loss. The visual field index actually does. It is a weighted deviation that has been corrected for everything, including general depressions, cataract, and such. But it's represented or described as the percentage of visual field that is left. And it is used mostly for progression analysis. Now, if we were to take these points and move everything over by one, just move everything, just change the, the values are all the same, the visual field index would just go significantly down because points that are closer to fixation are going to be weighted much more heavily. And the last thing we have is the gaze tracker. This is using Purkinje images. Uh, the machine is determining where the patient's fixation is. And it's probably more accurate than the fixation loss or the blind spot monitoring. Whereas small deviations above would be blinks. Large deviations above would be errant fixations, and small deviations below, the machine didn't actually know where the eye was at that time. And this is good because in blind spot monitoring, most of that is done early in the test, then they stop. This is done throughout the whole test. So we don't have people who may lose attention or become fatigued. Greg, is there anything in, in, in the chat room I should be aware of? Nothing is there. Excellent. I'm going to pause for just a second. I'm going to ask Greg to uh, add anything that I may have missed or anything he thinks I, that could be clarified. But this is the time, if you have any questions, I've, I've essentially gone through this. If you want me to go through anything else again or there's something you don't understand, 
please put it in the chat box right now. I'm, I'm not compelled to finish this lecture. I want to make sure we all understand this as well as possible. Greg, is there anything yeah. I missed or I could, I could say better? No, I mean, the only thing I'm just going to echo is, you know, the big thing to me is mean deviation. You know, mean deviation tells you how deep the defect is. So in this example there, Joe has, you know, minus 5.91. Zero would be normal. Um, if you have someone that's in the positive, I mean, they could be, you know, they could be trigger happy or, you know, for someone age 83, you know, maybe they do have a, a, a slightly uh, higher than average um, you know, mean deviation, but it just basically tells you, you know, how deep the defect is. You know, pattern standard deviation tells you how localized it is. So you can look at these two numbers here and you kind of have a mild to moderate defect that is very localized, which you can see if you look at that visual field, you can see that there's, you know, right above in that uh, superior nasal quadrant, one, two, three, four, five, six ish. Uh, points creating that very localized defect uh, that's on there. So, you know, it's just kind of what I echo that becomes more important with, um, you know, kind of glaucomatous visual fields and that pattern standard deviation kind of keeps grinding its way down in that same area uh, over and over again. And that's why in glaucoma, you'll see that five go to a seven in mean deviation to a nine and that pattern standard deviation keeps getting uh, keeps getting deeper. So it just tells you how localized it is. So those are the two things I'd like to point out, Joe. Excellent. Does anybody have any questions out there before we go on? I've gone through everything uh, as best I, as I can explain it. Now, you have two handouts. One is this presentation. The other handout is more a Word document that explains everything that I just gave you. So if you're not, if you if you if you don't think you can remember, you're gonna have everything. Everything explained just as I did. So you have that in your possession. But I'll, I'll point something out here is this nasal defect. You know, when looking at glaucoma or considering glaucoma, one of the first things I, I always ask is where is the nasal defect? Yeah, I'm looking for nasal loss. And you see there's a great degree of asymmetry here. And this asymmetry, obviously, is why the GHT is outside normal limits. Be, beware of this nasal so defect. Come to one of our five locations. No gimmicks. Got them. This is not... Th this is... This is not a glaucoma defect. Even though it's nasal, what I want to point out is... You have zero and zero above. You, you've got above and below. Not looking like this, asymmetry. You've got symmetry. That nasal defect is just that nasal. It is the patient's nose, or it's the trial lens. Now, it is very deep. That's where you have a mean deviation of minus three and, and a quarter. There are differences between adjacent points. That's why the pattern standard deviation is high. And the GHT is that there's not much here. I mean, you got you got a little bit of an artifact, but when it assigns a score here and assigns a score here, when they compare these match zones, these scores are going to be so low because of that blockage, it's going to be outside normal limits. Not that there's so much asymmetry in the visual field, is that these points have brought everything down in that analysis, and that's why it shows outside normal limits. So when you see a nasal defect looks like this with zeros above and below, you, you've got a dubious test here. You know, Joe, I would you know, probably say that if you go back, to you, that's a plus seven and a quarter. Um, I'm going to probably say that's probably a rim <laughs> defect from the high plus lens. You know, something to consider out there is um, for people that a lot of times what I'll do is just put a contact lens on the patient's eye when they start getting this high or ask the technician to do that. Okay, I, I see you just put the uh, hand out back in. Uh, thank you, Greg. <clears throat> now, and you may want to talk about this one, Greg, but the, this is the, the the beauty of the global indices and you know, we can kind of see, and these are obviously different patients. These are not the same patients, but 
We see here the GHT is borderline. There's a little bit of visual field uh, loss. It's a very high remaining visual field uh, in a percentage. Mean deviation is not very high, at two, less than 2%. The pattern standard deviation is fairly, uh, fairly low as well. It is statistically significant, but it's fairly low. Now we take a look at patient number two, we can see there's a greater degree of visual field loss. Visual field index is less visual field available in this patient. Mean deviation is much higher, and pattern standard deviation has jumped up. It's much higher because of the high standard devi the, the deviation or difference between adjacent points above and below. So the pattern standard deviation has jumped up. So it tells me that we're, lo we're losing visual field or we're, we're losing sensitivity and it's very localized. Now we jump up to another, another patient who has end stage disease. VFI is essentially zero. Mean deviation is minus three. But look at the pattern standard deviation. It is actually very low. And this is a worse visual field. Why? Because all the points adjacent to one another are about the same. They're very, they're all equally poor. So it's like a roller coaster and glaucoma starts going up, 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 and then it comes down. Greg, I know, I know you have a you have a strong interest in understanding in these things. You want to if you want to add anything here. Yeah, I mean, the last visual field there is obviously a paratometric blind eye. You see the visual field index is zero. So the mean deviation there is minus 32. Um, I actually did this on a on a one, one Monday morning after I was doing a lecture going, hmm, I wonder what a blind eye is. So I literally just went to uh, my technician and said, please turn on the visual field, type in age 65, let it run as if the patient's blind. And you can see there it's minus 32.67. And as uh, Joe mentioned, uh, you know, that's diffusely scattered throughout the whole visual field. So one thing you want to be careful of is what Joe is pointing out here is, you know, when you have that middle visual field and you see that 13 going to an 11, yeah, that's a superior arcuate defect. But you notice how that whole inferior field is still intact. If that inferior field starts to become uh, glaucomatous, what will happen is the mean deviation will continue to creep and get deeper, like to that 32, but the pattern standard deviation starts to come down because it's becoming diffusely scattered. So a lot of people would be like, oh, look, the, the, the pattern standard deviation is getting better. That's not some. That's not a good sign. That means the other side of the visual field is becoming involved. So that's just kind of how to use those numbers. Mean deviation again there kind of shows you how deep it is. And you can see that how localized it is by looking at the pattern. That's and, I yeah, thank you, Ray. A, re a really good question came in back to your initial slides. Do you think replacing 24-2 CETA FAST is adequate in place of 24-2 standard? Um, 24-2 standard and see the standard and see the fast are old tests. See the fast error is an a newer test, and it may not be available to everybody depending on how old your uh, how old your device is and what uh, iteration of the of the perimeter that you have. Uh, I think faster and and standard are very close. I'm a little bit dubious about 24-2 fast. Standard is standard is good. Um, FAST is a good screening test if you know the patient's normal. Uh, I feel more comfortable replacing CETA standard with CETA faster. I'm not sure I see it feel about CETA fast, but uh, if you can't get anything else, it's probably pretty reasonable. And, you know, the people that told us never, ever, ever try to compare FAST to standard to faster now say, oh, they're interchangeable. So they're, they're really... Re really, it is probably okay. Greg, your thoughts? Yeah, I do in glaucoma patients. I do twenty four dash two CETA standard, just because it crosses the threshold twice, and you're trying to really nail down that threshold. Um, I don't really use CETA fast um, for those. However, I will go from CETA standard to CETA faster. Mm -hmm 
if they graduate. So that's based upon, you know, my perimetrist. Uh, if she says that this patient's really, really good, the next time we can try CETA faster. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, and then someone asked down here, Joe and Greg, are you using 24-2C uh, at, at this time? And the answer, John, for that is um, if I start to see some nerve fiber layer drop out or some GCC loss, um, I'll start to start running that 24-2C that uh, and testing those extra 10 spots that are on that field. It's only a 24-2C if they're a glaucoma suspect or glaucoma, um, not really doing that to look for a, a, a neurological field. So that 24-2C for those who aren't familiar out there adds an extra 10 spots, but it's you know mainly for glaucoma. And that only comes in the faster variety as well. Uh, I've used it. I'm not using it. I don't like it. I don't know why. There's something. There's something visual about it that troubles me, but I've not. I've not put my finger on it yet. Now I'm going to talk very briefly. This is an old full threshold. I'm going to explain just a little bit more at what it did and why it was good and why it was not good and why we don't use it any longer. There are a couple things in here. If you notice, there are these extra points. You know, there these these extra. Why are they there? Well, during the test, and this was, you know, almost 17 minutes, you know, you know, the patient's sleeping, the perimetrist is sleeping, nothing's getting done. The machine determined that there's something aberrant about the initial determination of the threshold. So it went back and did it again. So whenever you see the, the, the parentheses there, it didn't like something. It thought something was remit, was amiss. So it went back and rechecked again. Why don't we do this? It takes time. It just takes too long. So that was all, we, all dropped the, uh, up from, from full threshold. But you also have this little SF and CPSD down here that uh, I'll talk to you about this. In full threshold, what used to be done was the machine, there are 10 points in the visual field and the machine would actually determine threshold for each of those points. And then later the test go back and do it again. And then, you know, rank them and then compare the threshold value of the first go round to the second go round. And SF means short term fluctuation. And what that was doing is trying to determine how reliable the patient was intra test. And the th thought pattern was in a very, very knowledgeable, responsive patient, short-term fluctuation should be very low. The patient is, you know, is consistent within the test. Well, the problem is, what well, it takes time. You know, you got to do 10 points and do them again. It just takes too much time. That's why it's 17 minutes. Short-term fluctuation is like the false negative. There are highly variable retinal sensitivities. The patient may be very, very sharp, very experienced, very alert, and they don't have the same response in, in the same test. Their short-term fluctuation is high because they actually have disease. So it, it is actually the, an increased SF, short-term fluctuation, intra-test variability is really like the earliest sign that you're going to have with glaucoma. But we don't test for it any longer because it takes too long. And the CPSD is really the same thing as the PSD, except it goes through the prism of intratest variability. So you can see it's, it's actually fairly close, and that the intratest variability in this patient was very slow. So that's why we, we all this is kind of valuable information, but it just took too doggone long. So that's why these things change. But SF short-term fluctuation is a lot, a, a lot like um, false negatives. It's actually could be indicative of disease and probably the increased short-term fluctuation, increased variability during the same test. Uh, you know, highly variable retinal sensitivities is probably indicative of actually of true disease. Now, I do want to talk about the grayscale. It's useful. You really need to look at that because nothing will show you 
neurogenic patterns any better. And here's an example. If we just look down here on this patient's uh, pattern, because I know we, we, you know, we've, I've heard people say, and you know, the only thing you need to look at is pattern deviation. Just look at the pattern deviation. Well, the pattern deviation is the true retroventricular visual field loss. But you have to look at other things. If I just looked at this, it looks like I've got a superior uh, superior arcuate defect. I look over here, I've got a superior arcuate defect, but there's not much nasal loss. But when I look here, what do I see? A blind spot breakout that happens to be stopping here. You know, you got visual field loss that is denser on a superior bitemporal uh, pattern. And this is a patient with a glaucoma and a pituitary adenoma. And in this patient, if we, if we were just to look, okay, it looks like I've got a superior and inferior arc scotoma in one eye that could match the optic nerves. I've got superior defect here, but you always get asked, where's the nasal loss? And these two points here, you know, what, what did we say earlier? You know, probably a visual, uh, uh, a trial lens artifact. Right. But when I look here, I can see how it stops at the vertical and it stops at the vertical. This is a hemianopic defect. And here's another patient with glaucoma. We can see if I look here, I've got an inferior arcuate scotoma. I've got a superior arcuate defect, probably some inferior hemifield loss as well. It looks all very well and good. I don't like what I see here, the blind spot. We stopped right there. I come across here and yeah, I've got a nice arcuate defect. But if we notice, there's a patch of less than zeros here. All right. Very dense. What do you see? This is a right inferior quadrant defect that is being buried underneath the glaucomatous visual field defect. Here's a hole within the hole. And this is a person who, after questioning her, admitted that she had a transient ischemic attack several years earlier. Neuroimaging showed that she had an old infarct and she had to get in to see stroke neurology because she was a stroke risk. And this was never a glaucoma patient, but this is a patient who was referred to me by a colleague in my practice. This was a 52-year-old male who complained of a blind spot when he's driving. He noticed that uh, he didn't see things on his left very well. And my colleague had done a 120 point full field screening that was very, very non revealing. So, we do a visual field. If we just look at the, the deviations here, it doesn't show us much, but what do we see here? Okay, there's a dense area there, kind of stopping, kind of matches over here. This is a person who had a left homonymous heavy anopic defect, he's 52 years old. That's not stroke. It was actually a brain tumor. Uh, got an image. So he has had neurosurgery. They got most of the tumor. And uh, I don't know how he is at this moment, but his wife has called and left messages thanking me for being so thorough and helping him find his brain tumor. So we have to look at the uh, at the grayscale. It's very helpful. Joe, a question right, came in. And yeah. The question came in. It says, how many times do you repeat a visual field? Uh, to say the defect is real uh, slash repeatable. Two, maybe three times. How about you, Greg? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you now for it to be repeatable, right, you have to do it more than once. And I get where you're coming from here. Um, but, you know, if, you know, if the visual field test taker is doing a really good job. All I need is really two to confirm, but I agree, Joe, you know, Hey, if you want to do that third one uh, to mm -hmm. see if it's repeatable. Um, yeah. I guess it all depends on how well you think the person took the field. So. And, and something, it, it, and uh, another answer could be, it depends on what we're looking at. If we're, if we're looking at glaucoma, I tell you, the short-term fluctuation is the earliest change we're going to see on a visual field, but we don't do that any longer. So really, clinically, the earliest change that we see is a small, shallow, fluctuating scotoma. And I want to see that in three visual fields in a row or three out of four in a row because that's sudden. Now, 
going back to something like this right here, I will tell you every year in my glaucoma population, I have a patient who accidentally puts in a, a, a neurogenic field. I'm going to repeat that one more time. And if that pattern is still there, I'm going to investigate it. Usually it disappears. So if it's neurogenic, one if I'm suspecting neurogenicity, one time, you know, what one, one repeat is fine. Glaucoma, shallow fluctuating scotoma, I want to see th probably three. Now we have to have what I call the four R's of visual fields. We need reliable, which we talked about already. This is a very subjective determination now. We want it recognizable as glaucoma instead of something else, relatable to the anatomy and reproducible. I think reproducibility is probably the greatest indicator of reliability. And when we have reproducibility, it increases the likelihood of these insignificant defects are actually you know, relatively significant. And this is a great example of a bad example. You know, this is the worthless visual field. False positive errors are, are at 54%. We have threshold of values well in excess of what a patient should, should be able to see. We've got that white scriptoma. It says abnormally high sensitivity. That to me is garbage. Mean deviation is a almost a plus four. That isn't physiologically possible. And the pattern deviation could be better or the same as the total, not worse. And if you just look at this, you may think, geez, there's a lot of visual field loss. Well, no, because these relatively normal values are much lower than these super sensitive values. So it drags it down. And that's why the pattern is worse than the total in that situation. And this one, I'm not sure the patient is even it, 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 what the patient was actually doing. I think he's going for a high score. False positive is 96%. I think he missed one. I probably missed one value there. And there's just nothing, you know, mean deviation and almost 20. That, that, that's just, you know, not, not helpful. But when you see pattern deviation worse than total deviation, high false positive, it's going to be associated with high sensitivity. You're going to have white scotomas in there. No useful information whatsoever. And of course, so Joe, be a, yeah. a question came in. It says, during during testing, how many times would you uh, you think to restart a test before ex, uh, accepting it is uh, as unreliable? You make you 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 could probably restart a test one time to give the patient you know more coaching. Uh, explain to them you're going to see you're supposed to see less than half of the half of the, of the stimuli. It knows you 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 have to blink, so don't be afraid to blink. And signal only when you, you know you stop. You know you can restart one time. After that, you, you, you're. Yeah, you know, if you think to restart a second time, I think I think you're just you're just wasting everybody's time. Now these butterfly patterns here, that that's a that's a sense of, of fatigue. These these points here, the ones that are tested first, that's when the patient is most alert. They have that central error. They they were actually alert, then they drifted off and uh, they weren't uh, participating. And this is what we're looking for is we're looking for, you know, the planes of Kansas right here, you know, the gaze tracker. This is a person who had a few errant fixations, but did pretty well. This is a person who was a little bit nervous during the start of the test, but as the time went on, they settled down pretty well. This looks like the Manhattan skyline. That's not really useful to me. And I'm not really sure what happened here. If the patient was even in the room when it was being done. So that brings me to polling question number four, Greg. What would we see what that is? So I think I've forgotten. Oh, here's a word, B B J E R R U M, possibly escatoma, is another term for the arcuate defect. How do you pronounce it? Is the B silent, as in germ scotoma, or is it a hard B, but germ, or is neither correct? 
And Joe, while while that's rolling in, I got a direct message here that says mm -hmm. we were talking about those three visual fields um, being repeated. It says over what time span? Good question. Uh, it, it it can mean it can be done. I wouldn't do them all the same day. I might repeat a test. I might repeat a test. Uh, one, you know, do it once on the same day. It has been said that if you, when you're newly diagnosing glaucoma, this a study, you know, study just came out that that kind of showed you should have three visual fields a year for the first two years. So six visual fields in the course of two years to determine what is the rate of progression to see if it's a fast progressor, progressor or a slow progressor. But repeating them, you know, if, if, you, if you're looking for that, that, you know, that, uh, that fluctuating scotoma, that can be, that could be done over the course of, of six, of six months, to 12 months. All right. So if, I think we if if the results are abnormal high sensitive and excess fixation losses, can we still build a visual field? Well, you can you can build the visual field because you've done it and you're going to interpret it. And your interpreted it's your interpretation is abnormally high uh, sensitivity, no useful information. And then I'll just add to that, you know, you can, you know, try and coach and repeat. You know, but for 10 years, I would not, you know, recommend, you know, if, if it's abnormal and you keep getting the same result and, and then billing and billing. But I agree you can bill for it, you know, try maybe a second or third time. And uh, after that, you know, maybe mm -hmm. not do the test. So, yeah. It, it, it's like a, it, it's almost like it, remi it reminds you of a patient uh, I, I ordered neuroimaging on. And the and the MRI came out normal. And the patient wanted me to pay you know pay them back for the visual for um, for the MRI <laughs> because it was normal. I mean, would you rather I found a brain tumor? You know, you, you know the MRI is that is is that free if it comes back normal? All right. So the answer is is a bajerum. Is it germ? It is neither. It is Bayerum's scotoma. So. Not Bajerum, not Jerem, by your rooms, it's Scandinavian. But you know, we have relative scotomas, fluctuating scotomas. You know, these these are the early ones we have to look for. Absolute scotomas, the paracentral defects, the nasal defect or the nasal step of Rene, the Bayerum scotoma, the altitude defects. Now, gel depression, diffuse loss, very rare in glaucoma. That that's something else. That's cataract and meiosis. But these are all potential losses. We have a superior nasal step. We have a nasal defect in, in, in concert with an inferior arcuate scotoma or a Bayerum scotoma, another inferior arcuate defect and a nice paracentral defect. I can't say that these are glaucomatous. All I can say is they're potentially consistent with glaucoma. I'm going to skip ahead and try to find something kind of interesting for us to talk about in our last uh, few minutes here. Patternless visual fields. These are visual fields that, that give me nothing. Got a couple of points here, a couple of points there, even though the GHT is outside normal limits, probably because of those points there. We have a good degree of probably cataractogenesis. We have some edge points here. I'm not really impressed by any of these. These edge points here are very dense, probably a ring scotoma. We talked about this one already, zero above and zero below, very dense. You know, that is probably the trial lens. These don't have any patterns for me at all. I am more impressed by this one. GHT is outside normal limits. Now, even GHT borderline is significant to me. Because it doesn't take much to go from borderline to outside normal limits. The EFI is 97%, not much loss, but we do have a focal defect right there. Standard deviation is really quite high because of this focal defect. And that is a nice accumulation of points, not edge points, in an inferior arcuate area, which is a glaucoma-prone zone. None of these here kind of really matter to me that much. 
That one is actually fairly impressive to me. Not edge points, all right? Pretty dense, pretty consistent. And this is what I mean by shallow fluctuating scapelma. Nothing here is really looking all that impressive within normal limits, borderline within normal limits. All right, not much going on there, but you have a hemi field, you know, something in, in the superior hemi field. We look here, we have something in the superior hemi field. We look here, we have something in superior hemi field. If these are three in a row, that counts. Here's another example. We have something in the inferior hemi field, inferior hemi field again, inferior hemi field, normal. So this is the three in a row or three out of four, where one was actually pretty well normal. And that's why the shallow flux range glaucoma is the earliest thing that we're going to see in glaucoma. Understand that this point is not damaged. And this point is not damaged. The whole hemi field is damaged. And as the disease progresses, the, the shallow fluctuating scotoma is going to become not so fluctuating and not so shallow. Any comments there, Greg? Mm, no. Oh, uh, yes. If you suspect a field defect due to meiosis, do you repeat the field after dilation? It had to be really, really pretty, pretty meiotic. And it's not going to show up as a focal defect. It's going to show up as a general reduction of sensitivity. Now, I will tell you, I when I do visual fields in my right eye, I you know, I get I get really bad vitreous. I always come out in my right eye with a general, I've got, I've got a little bit of a nasal, a little bit of a nasal defect. I also have general reduction of sensitivity. It isn't cataract, because I've had cataract surgery. It isn't capsule, I've had capsulotomy. It's my vitreous. I can see great. I've got, I've got great acute in my right eye, but I get general reduction of sensitivity every time. So meiosis is not going to give you a focal defect. It's going to give you the general reduction of sensitivity. And, you know, this is, you know, example of cataract, and post-op, you can certainly see that going from the total deviation to the pattern deviation, that whole elevator factor works pretty well. But if you were to look at this, you would be suspicious that there is a superior defect going on. So it's good, but it's not perfect. So I'm not that concerned when I start to see something like this because post-op, it does get a lot better. Joe, let me make a comment regarding the uh, pupil size there for, mm -hmm. for Stephen. Um, one of the things that you're supposed to do when you're programming the visual field is if you look at the visual fields that Joe are putting up there, if you go back to a visual field, Joe, uh, right there would be good. Um, right above the grayscale where the RX is, where it says the acuity, if you put in the pupil size, the visual field should try to adjust. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that we typically don't um you know, do a lot, but I will tell my patient or my technician, you know, hey, these pupils are small, put in three if they're tiny, you know, if they're large and eight millimeters, you know, I, I'll warn her on these visual fields because you are supposed to put the pupil size in, as you can see on these visual fields. And the visual field will adjust, uh, you know, due to the algorithms. Joe, direct message here. Let me just read it real quick and see mm -hmm. what it, I didn't really read it, but it says so many visual fields give you scattered points, which do not make sense. No pattern whatsoever. A uh, lot of fixation losses, repeat visual field uh, two times and all over the place dilemma what to do. Now, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. That's actually kind of good, right? If you're looking yeah. for a glaucoma, um, because glaucoma is repeatable, you know, it's a scattered uh, defect. Um, you know, maybe it is a sign of early disease, you know, uh, the defect is there, the patient recovers, because remember, if you're thick looking for glaucoma, glaucoma doesn't go on to off, right? It goes, that retinal ganglion cell gets wounded. 
So maybe one time in the early disease, it gets wounded, but it's not progressing. That oxidative stress is not moving down and it recovers. You know, I've seen visual fields after treating a patient with glaucoma, they come in with pressures of 28 and 30 and they have a mild defect. I see their visual field can improve. It's not going to go back to zero, but a minus four might go to a minus 350 or even a three, you can kind of see an uphill trend, um, you know, so that scattered defect could be that it's wounded, recovering, maybe it is early, um, maybe it's just, you know, a patient that's just not a good test taker uh, that's out there. But Joe, I'll let you make comments on that. Well, th I think that dovetails well into this, you know, don't call, you know, isolated missed points or, or scattered pressure. If there's a structural correlate, we, we're, we're going to look at the OCT now, and we're going to look at the optic nerve. Now, here's a patient, uh, GHT is within normal limits. There's not really much going on, but on a nerve fiber analysis, there's a, there's a deviation, and we can certainly see the patient has a very thin rim tissue. So even though the GHT is within normal limits here, and maybe, Greg, this is one where you want to do a 10-degree field or you want to do a 24-2C to get a little bit more information, you know, maybe this is too broad to give it, you know, to be totally sensitive. So look for the structural functional correlation as well. And don't call the pressure isolated miss point if they're repeatable. Now, this was this was a patient who had uh, ocular hypertension, so to speak. Uh, we have a pattern on the pattern deviation. We have a little bit of a defect here, defect there, defect there, one, two, three in a row. They're repeatable. And the glaucoma hemifield test was actually within normal limits on all visual fields. I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump ahead and, and uh, look at a couple things. I'm going to start wrapping things up here. So the question is, is this visual field progressing? And we look at it. Superficially, you may take a look and say, geez, there's some points there that weren't there before, but what I want to point out, what we should notice is pattern deviation is worse than total deviation. Nothing is really egregious up here. False positives was list, listed as zero, whereas false positives were six here. But pattern deviation, worse than total deviation, I'm very suspicious of that. GHT is within normal limits, but this one is borderline. VFI is the same at 99 in each one. But what I want to point out is look at the mean deviation. I have a minus 1.24 and a plus 0.51. There's uh, almost a two decibel difference between the two. You know, do I believe this? Now there's too much going on here to uh, say this progression. What do we do? We repeat it. What happens there? It matches up pretty well at that point. And I'm going to so go back to with, that. Go back to that visual yeah. field there. Um, mm -hmm. The one before. Yeah, so this one right here, uh, which I guess is uh, the patient's left eye, the one that's kind of a little grayer on the screen here. If you guys look, if you look at the mean deviation, see how it's plus 0 0.61 or 51. Um, if you go up, the false positives are not through the roof. So the patient's really not trigger happy. This is a 63-year-old patient. Um, that is slightly above. And then what the visual field did was push that down from total to pattern. So that, what is that, Joe, right beside, is that a 29 and in that, in right by fixation there? Uh, what's that number? Yeah, 29. 29. And what it did is it pushed it down because this patient's a little abnormally sensitive, but based upon, you know, reliable visual field. And it pushed it down to make that 29 even more abnormal. Uh, that's what happened in that field. Now, is this patient getting worse? And superficially, you can look at this and think to yourself, gee, this is not good. I mean, we've gone from a visual field index of 43 down to a 22. It looks like there's been extension here of the visual field loss. We've gone from a 1879 down to a 22. And the pattern standard deviation is uh, virtually the same. And you may be thinking, geez, this is a person who has really uh, has progressed. Well, you don't want to make any knee-jerk reactions based upon one bad visual field. And what I want to point out, point out here is the phobia. 
Here the phobia is off. Here the phobia was turned on and it's 30 for 34 decibels. And that's actually pretty darn good, right? And this looks like there's a central scotoma. And I don't think that the visual field would, or the phobia sensitivity would be so good if this were true. So what happens is when they're doing the foveal threshold, you know, that center fixation, you can't, put, there's no light there at the hole. They, they look at that center hole. So they have to redirect their attention downwards for a few seconds while it tests the fovea. That wasn't done. So this patient right here was looking, looking centrally. Here, they direct themselves downwards. The test, the foveal threshold is done and the patient either does it or is not instructed to now change their fixation up to the central point. They're still looking down. It looks like it got worse. Repeat testing, it, got, it, 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 it improved. And one of the comments I'll make is that, you know, I had that happen and, uh, you know, that really doesn't happen on a wearable type of visual field because the wearable visual fields, the, the uh, test is dynamic. They're not looking straight ahead. In order to get that inferior field, the patient looks up, the device uh, shines the stimulus to get the superior visual field, the patient looks down. So the cool thing is, and, and it's it's using kind of active monitoring that's out there, it's not using these gaze monitors and these fixation spots, it's actually making sure the patient's eye and using kind of pupil fixation uh, to make sure that the patients are lined up. So it's kind of neat in these wearables, you don't really run into some of these challenges. No wearables have their challenges in their own, but yet some of these challenges that Joe and I are talking about uh, uh, are, are seeming to go away. Uh, you know, distance viewing, yes, you got to do spherical equivalent, black background, movable dynamic visual field, some pretty cool stuff that's coming. And the same thing happened here. Here's a 90-year-old 90, 90 patient. Looked like they had gotten worse. You know, this was done 1114. Had to repeat it. We can see right here they did the they had the foveal threshold. So the patient was looking down, was not instructed to change the fixation after the fovea had been determined. They kept looking down. It brought the whole thing down. I knew it was artifactual. I knew the patient didn't get worse. Didn't look like anything the patient had done before. Repeat the test. Turn off the foveal threshold, don't confuse them. And that's what happened over time. So with this, another very, very similar thing. Patients got a 30 decibel here, 10 degree visual field, 31 decibels, almost the exact same thing. Patient just changed their fixations. When you have paracentral defects, their fixation is relatively crucial. Greg, we never finished these talks. We, we went really, really deep uh, on visual field analysis. I think I'm toast. I think the audience is probably toast. Let's just wrap this up and bring this on home. Okay. Again, thank you very much. And I don't see any other questions in the in the in the chat box there. If you have any other questions, please put them in. This is live and interactive. Um, with that being said, questions and thanks. Uh, Joe, you took uh, you know a tough subject, visual fields, all these parameters, and uh, you know taking them at times to a deep level, but then making them into something that makes sense. So truly appreciate uh, you doing this. Your virtual round of applause is rolling in with the thank yous uh, that are out there. Well deserved. Again, this is visual. Uh, this is field follies and perimeter pearls. This was an interactive distance learning course. Joe, thank you for doing this. Vanessa, thanks for being here and being our conference administrator and COPE coordinator. Uh, thank you very much.